All right. Welcome back, everybody, to the Dharma Doors. This is MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective, both in reality and virtual reality all at once. Um, so uh, tonight we're going to continue looking at our sutra. That sutra again is the Manjushri Buddha Kshetra Gunavyuha uh, Sutra, the Array of Virtues of Manjushri's Buddha Realm. Um, the theme for tonight, as you all know, each Sunday night now has a theme, kind of something that we're focused on. And the theme tonight, which will come from the reading, the theme tonight is, well, the fancy term, the fancy Sanskrit word is Aranyachada, which means forest dwelling. So tonight we're going to kind of focus on the idea of, well, specifically Aranyachada. <laughs> what does that mean? Uh, before we do that, let me just remind you, we've been going through this sutra very slowly, kind of one section at a time. And that's been really helpful for the new Dharma Doors format of just kind of wanting to focus on one idea. And this sutra is about, well, it's about the Bodhisattva path, as I've mentioned now many times. And specifically, it's about this idea of purifying one's Buddha land. And how does a Bodhisattva do that? And the Buddha has explained to us sort of how to do that in a way, or at least that's been the focus of the sutra. And the main focus, just to make this clear for tonight, or simple, I should say, the main idea is about this bodhisattva vow, which is this vow, to put it simply, not just to awaken oneself, not just to in, become enlightened oneself, but it's this kind of vow, a determination to see to it that all beings are awakened. <laughs> and we did a lot of talking about, in classes prior to this, we did a lot of talking how you, you could think of that as this tremendously altruistic, caring for all sentient beings. Absolutely, please think of it that way. But of course, in all of the talks leading up to this, we've kind of been talking about how from the Bodhisattva's point of view, it makes absolute perfect sense that the only awakening could be a total awakening of all beings. Anything short of that is actually going to be a kind of delusion. And that delusion of an awakening for oneself is been, has been represented by these two characters, the voice hearer and the Pratekya Buddha, right? This uh, uh, follower. Uh, a student of the Buddha, or these solitary enlightened beings. So the idea here is, is the Buddha has said that what makes a bodhisattva a bodhisattva is this particular vow, this particular determination with a particular understanding of awakening, and not just any old awakening, the highest state of awakening Anuttara Samyak Sambodhi. So we've already basically sort of learned about that in the first part of the sutra. And what we've been going through lately, the last few Sundays, are these series of teachings about how that aspiration or determination or that vow, how we can make sure and in, in the language of the version I've been reading, the language is how can we make sure that our aspirations will not degenerate and that 
we will acquire these purified Buddha lands. So tonight, I want to start actually by that idea of degenerate, our aspiration degenerating. And what has happened is, by the way, I'll remind you, the Buddhas has said, oh yeah, and if you don't want your aspiration or determination to degenerate, there's one quality that you should have. That's what we learned about several Sundays ago. And that was the quality of being like Akshobhya Buddha, being imperturbable in a sense. And that was the one quality that would see to it that our aspiration didn't degenerate. Then last week and the week before we learned, the, the Buddha then goes on to say, oh, and there's two, two qualities that if a bodhisattva has, their aspiration will not degenerate. And that is, as long as they don't aspire to be a, a voice hearer or a Pratekya Buddha, a solitary enlightened one, if, as long as they don't aspire either of those paths, then their aspiration will not degenerate. Well, tonight we're going to learn about three <laughs> qualities that a bodhisattva has that make sure that their aspiration doesn't degenerate. And you guessed it. Next time it's going to be four qualities, and the time after that is going to be five qualities. And this is, of course, what the, the Buddhists call anguttara, adding one. It's a style, it's a way the Buddha teaches where he kind of puts it to you simply and a little more complex and a little more complex. And there's a way in which it's always the same teaching but sort of from these different angles. And so tonight we're gonna to get three new angles on how we can make sure our aspirations don't degenerate. But first, this word degenerate, or yeah, degrade. I, mm, you know, I have to always choose what I'm gonna talk about. You know me, I can get a little distracted in that way. So I haven't mentioned this up to this point, but I think tonight's a good night to start here. So, and the reason why I wanna do this is because tonight is about interpretation. Tonight's about interpreting texts, interpreting these things. And so the interpretation begins with this word, uh, degenerate. And I'll read for you tonight, just to get you really, really primed for the whole show tonight. The section that we're going to be reading, very, it's a very small little paragraph. He says, this is the Buddha, Buddha, Shariputra. If Bodhisattva Mahasattvas, those great beings, if they have three qualities, their aspirations will not degenerate and they will acquire the arrays of virtues of a Buddha realm just as they wish. What are these three? Shariputra. They are that bodhisattvas are eager to live in solitude Give, give the gift of dharma without expectation of material reward. And three, abide by their vows of discipline. <laughs> so those are the three. And when I say tonight is about interpretation, I kind of want to look at this and sort of, I want to do a, a, an exercise tonight that I thought would be interesting, where we just sort of talk about it in terms of that, what, what I just said, <laughs> like literally what they translated it as, this team of translators translating from Tibetan. I want to talk about just what they just interpreted it or translated it as. Then I want to go a little deeper and start to give you some interesting language things that are going on in the text where maybe that translation is a little not quite right, or I wouldn't say right or wrong, but just not complete. 
And then we're going to go really deep into an interpretation of those three qualities. So we're really going to come at them at these kind of three levels. But again, I want to begin with this idea of our aspirations not degenerating. So this is actually a very technical idea within the world of bodhisattva-ness. <laughs> what they're translating as degenerate would be much, much better as regress. And the reason why I say that is, is because this word, which is avivartika, avivartika means not regressing. And we hear about this a lot regarding bodhisattvas, that they reach a certain point in their practice where the bodhisattvas become non-regressing bodhisattvas, avivartika. They become avivartika, which means non-regressing. And that's actually what that word that's being translated as degenerate, it, it is. It's about not regressing. And just to kind of give you another way of thinking about the bodhisattva path, and in particular, this idea of reaching a point of non-regression, there's a really, really good, clear corollary to this. It actually might not even be a corollary. It might actually be the same exact idea. But what I'm thinking about is, is well, we have this expression. We have this expression of, in English at least, of falling off the wagon. So there's this idea that perhaps regarding alcohol, for example, it may come that there may be a point in one's life, maybe in your life, where you decide, you know what? this whole alcohol drinking thing isn't really working out. <laughs> it's not working out for me. It's not working out for those around me. I vow, basically, it's a little strong of a language, but the idea is you say, you know what? I'm done. I, I have now determined my aspiration is to not consume alcohol anymore. But then you fall off the wagon and you have a drink or two or 10. And that's regressing. That is to regress. And what I want you to kind of pay attention to is that it has to do with an aspiration that you've made, a determination that you made. You were, you're the one that came to the decision that you wanted to do this because that's the funny thing about vows or these kinds of uh, uh, intentions, intention settings or determinations, the funny thing about them is nobody can do that for us. We take the vow. We decide it's time that this stops. And so the regression is this fact that you made the decision to stop, but then you didn't. It's okay. The idea is, is that, and this is where I want to get this really clear. The idea is, is there's, there's actually a moment in, at least in the bodhisattva path, where the bodhisattva becomes non-regressing. The point is, is that there is a clear understanding that up until that point, there may be regression. That's, it's understood that this will happen. And so the idea here is, is that we practice and we cultivate. And so if you wanted to sort of feel or understand the idea of being a non-regressing bodhisattva, well, the idea is, is that let's say, well, I know that this gets difficult and tricky with my alcohol analogy because of certain biological aspects of that. So please bear with my comparison. But the idea is, is that 
the bodhisattva that's non-regressing in a way reaches a point where that type of backsliding, as they call it, is basically impossible. Now, again, my comparison, I know has shortcomings in that way, but let me clarify my comparison. In this bodhisattva vow or determination or aspiration for awakening, one way that you could think of it, a really simple way, is regarding those nasty three poisons, those three kleshas, right? Attraction, aversion, and confusion, otherwise known as greed, anger, and delusion. The way that you can think about it is that a bodhisattva makes a vow, makes a determination, aspires to cut off the three defilements. I'm done with <laughs> out of control desire. I'm done with anger. I've recognized that anger doesn't, it, it it just is, it doesn't work for me, for others, everything. And I've recognized that this sense of self I have, there's something off about it. So I kind, I'm done attaching to it in that way and thus reinforcing it. My point is the Bodhisattva makes a similar vow as someone who wants to put down alcohol. The Bodhisattva vow, though, is about not just alcohol, it's about desiring anything actually like actually craving or wanting or desiring in an addictive way anything the bodhisattva makes a vow to not have that relationship with the objects of the world again also makes the vow to not get angry at others not to get angry at themselves in that way and also to cut off the delusion of self now, just because you aspire and vow to do those things, but it doesn't mean you're not going to get angry. It doesn't mean you're not going to want things and, and get all whiny if you don't get them, right? And it doesn't mean that you're going to completely awaken to this uh, no self idea. But that's the aspiration. And the idea is, is that a bodhisattva can, can reach a certain point where those three poisons are cut off completely and there's no more regressing back. They basically, in a sense, become incapable of getting angry, incapable of getting kind of cravey, wanty in that way, and incapable of generating that deluded sense of self. That's the idea of a non-regressing bodhisattva. And it's the idea of, well, it's the idea of what the, the Buddha is talking about. If you want, if a bodhisattva wants their aspiration to not backslide and degenerate, they want to reach that non-regressing state. Well, these are three qualities that can make sure that that will happen. <laughs> All right, everybody feeling okay with that definition of non-regressing? Avavaita, right. Avaivartika, great. So let's, now let's dive into the content tonight. So. Again, these three qualities are about, very, very quickly, they're about uh, being eager to live in solitude, giving the gift of Dharma without expecting reward, and abiding by their vows of discipline. So let's just take those very quickly at face value. So the first one, eager to live in solitude. So there's a lot more <laughs> to this idea, like a lot, lot more. In fact, again, I may not even get past this, this point tonight. But let's begin with just the surface level, which is this idea of eager to live in solitude. So that is sort of definitely, I think, very much the, the ethos of this uh, quality. This sort of, I, I personally wouldn't translate it as eager. 
I think Eager's actually very strong, and it's and as you as you all know, I am referring to the an original Chinese version of this for comparison, and the Chinese is definitely not about it being eager. It's actually more about enjoying, enjoying being in solitude. And so, and, and there's much, much more to it than that. But I just want you to know that that's sort of the first interpretive level. Is a bodhisattva eager to live in solitude or like the Chinese would suggest they're just, they enjoy living, being in solitude. So there's that. But again, just at a surface level, we're just interested in sort of two different directions. Being alone and being kind of comfortable with that, or sort of always, you know, needing to be socializing in that way. And actually, when, when the party's over, and everybody goes home, you get uncomfortable, or you don't like it. And all of a sudden, you want to call somebody or something, because being alone, you don't enjoy it. <laughs> You're not eager for it. The idea is, is that a quality of a bodhisattva is that if they enjoy solitude, their aspirations will not degenerate or regress in that sense. Whereas, ergo, the idea being, if one is sort of, you know, that kind of in need of socializing in that way, the idea is that it's going to be difficult. And I think from now, as soon as I start to get deeper into this, it'll, I think, make a lot more sense. But for the most part, given, given how important quiet seated meditation is to this whole Buddhist project, if you don't enjoy being alone, yeah, it's probably going to be difficult in that sense to purify a Buddha land, purify your mind and do all those things. It's probably gonna be difficult. So that's the surface level idea of this. Bodhisattvas are eager or enjoy being in solitude versus kind of more uh, socializing that way. And I don't wanna make it sound like Bodhisattvas don't want to socialize. I don't mean it that way. I mean it about that, and it's the way I try to describe it, but it's that sense of being comfortable and the sense of being comfortable by oneself versus, you know, not being comfortable by oneself and kind of needing distraction in that way or something to that effect. Let me go one step deeper, though, and I think it'll start to make sense. And in fact, it'll make sense why I wanted to spend tonight talking about interpretation, because I know many of you, maybe you don't read Chinese and you don't have access to the original Tibetan. You don't know Tibetan. So if you're reading a sutra like this, all you have to go on is what's here. And if that were the case, you would walk away maybe thinking one thing about bodhisattvas. So I, of course, I read that uh, from the English, from the Tibetan, and I was like, huh, bodhisattvas are eager to live in solitude. Let's check and see what Shikshananda has to say. Shikshananda is the Chinese, or he wasn't Chinese, but he translated the sutra into Chinese. And so Shikshananda has, oh, they should really enjoy abiding. And then it's tricky, but it says that they should really enjoy abiding in an aranya. Or it could be they really basically enjoy aranya charya. Aranya practice. So as soon as I saw the Chinese, and by the way, I want you to know in Chinese, there's three Chinese characters for a, ra, na. And it's a transliteration in Chinese, it's a transliteration of the Sanskrit word 
Aranyaka, or something to that effect. And that word has tremendous significance in the world of Buddhism. So first of all, it means a forest. So now we're at the second level of interpretation of this. Oh, bodhisattvas don't necessarily, they're not necessarily eager to live in solitude. They are eager or they greatly enjoy abiding in an aranya, in a forest. So that's a little different. Now, I want you to know the connotation, the meaning of aranya chara, aranya practice, it is about being alone in the woods. <laughs> It, it, and it is always about being alone in the woods. And what I mean is, is that you would have a vihara and a vihara is like a, um, a clearing is I think literally what the word vihara means, but it would be like a clearing in the woods where the sangha, all the monastics would get together and then they would, they would live together, get up in the morning, go into town, beg for food, come back to the vihara and meditate kind of in together, maybe listen to the Buddha, give a Dharma talk. And that was the Sangha at a vihara. But it was common for members of the Sangha to go out alone into the woods to do a Ranyachara. So what happens is, is that a, a scholar a, who does Tibetan, who translated the version that we're reading in English, they probably read Aranyachara, went to a dictionary, looked it up, and it probably said something to the effect of solitary meditation practice. And so they went with the interpretation that a bodhisattva should be eager to live in solitude. I think it's actually really helpful and important to know that they're specifically talking about this forest dwelling practice. And that's important for two reasons. One, while solitude has a lot to do with Aranyachara, it also has a lot to do with the forest. <laughs> like it has a lot to do with that environment in that way. So now what I'm talking about is this. If I asked you, what, do you wanna, um, do you wanna go in solitary confinement? <laughs> like in a prison solitary confinement for 30 days? Or you want to go on a, on a yacht, a luxury cruise yacht with a bunch of people for 30 days. And if you were like, well, solitary confinement or the party on the yacht, like if you were having trouble deciding, or if you were like, I'll go with the yacht or whatever, you didn't, you didn't fail the bodhisattva test is what I mean. But you might think you failed the bodhisattva test because if you read this, you were like, oh, bodhisattvas want to be alone, want to be in solitude. And I don't want to be in solitary confinement. So I must not be a bodhisattva, right? Let me paint a different picture for you. Let me tell you a little bit about Aranya Chada, right? What if I told you Let's see, let me paint you a very interesting picture. What if I told you I had this really special cabin in the, in the woods, right? And it's got this great little pot belly stove and it's, you know, pantry just full of really good food for you to make and all of that. And here's the keys. It's all yours for a month. R go ahead. <laughs> The idea, yeah, the idea is for some, that idea of a little cabin with a pot belly stove and just me and my Dharma books and meditating, that sounds 
where do I sign up? That's my feeling about the boat. A quality of a bodhisattva is that they enjoy, would enjoy that, that that would be desirable in, in their mind, like that that would actually be a good time. There are those, of course, in the world for whom that would be a nightmare. Even that, you know, with the pot belly stove and everything, right? There are those for whom that would be a nightmare. And I'm not saying, you know, they can't be bodhisattvas or anything like that. But my interpretation of the text is that a bodhisattva who enjoys Aranya practice, the forest dwelling practice like that, has a much better chance of their of their virtue of their vows their virtues in that sense not degenerating in that sense but again i think that this sort of it lines up very well with the meditation practice in that sense and what the meditation practice is kind of all about really quickly just as a reminder the idea is, is that from the time we're born, if not before then, we are conditioned to derive joy and pleasure and happiness from things. That the joy comes from these things. So the idea of being without those things might seem not so fun in that way. The practice though, this meditation practice, at first it's maybe not fun. At first it's maybe not enjoyable. And again, that's because we're conditioned to get enjoy, to get joy from consuming things, not just with our mouth, of course, too, but consuming with our eyes, consuming with our ears, our nose, our body, and so because we're conditioned to do it that way, we're conditioned to be happy that way, the practice is actually about learning and being conditioned to derive a joy and happiness from independence from things. What a thought, right? <laughs> to actually get joy from not needing things, from not. So if that's the project, to kind of change our minds, literally, from being conditioned one way to kind of being conditioned another way. If that's the project, and if a purified Buddha land is a mind that doesn't need or want things for enjoyment in that way, if that's the project and that's the goal, the idea is, is that if you don't enjoy being that, like, it, it will never happen, is my point. So, again, even though it might not be enjoyable at first, through the cultivation, maybe it becomes enjoyable in that way. But what I want you to see in terms of the logic of the sutra, it's, it's saying, but if you don't ever enjoy that being alone, that Aranya practice, this could be very difficult, but for very logical reasons, again, not, in, not for any, uh, you know, any, uh, any kind of problem with sin or fault in that way. It's just a matter of logic. Okay, is everybody ready for the much deeper interpretation of Aranyachara? Okay, so the thing about reading a sutra like this is you have to really be aware of what you're reading. And what I mean is in this sutra, even the uh, however many pages we've read so far, this sutra has made multiple allusions to another text, a very, very important Mahayana Buddhist text, which is the Vajra Pranyaparamita Sutra, the otherwise known as the Diamond Sutra. So 
I had one around here somewhere, but regardless, I'm always saying how important the Vajrapranya Paramita Sutra is for understanding Mahayana Buddhism. In my estimation, it's the beginning, the initial Mahayana Sutra that started all this. It's very important. And like I said, a sutra like this, it demonstrates internally with the language it uses, it demonstrates that it's very aware of the Vajra Sutra and the message of the Vajra Sutra. That being the case, as soon as I saw in the Chinese version that this wasn't about being in solitude, but this was about enjoying Aranya practice. My Vajra alarm bells immediately went off. And so I want to tell you about a very, very important chapter of the Vajra Sutra. It's going to be a further deeper level of interpretation. So the particular chapter I want to uh, break down for you tonight is chapter nine. It's funny too, because chapter nine has been on my mind almost every night that we've been doing this sutra. And it's funny that when we got to this point in the, the, in the sutra where they're talking about Aranya practice, that I went to our Vajra Sutra. The reason why chapter nine is really relevant to this is chapter nine deals with what are called the four fruits. The four fruits are, or they're sometimes also called the four stages, the stage of stream enterer, once returner, non-returner, arahat. I've already done quite a bit of talking about these four stages, and I've already in a way been referencing or alluding to the Vajra Sutra, but tonight I want to give it to you more explicitly. So if you've never read the Vajra Pranya Paramita Sutra, it's a pretty short sutra as far as these things go, and it's a very simple dialogue between the Buddha and a monk named Subhuti. It's just a back and forth between the two of them. No bodhisattvas per se, no nagas or yakshas or gandharavas or heaven, all heaven, these heavenly, just Subhuti and the Buddha. And it's a very interesting dialogue. It has a lot to do with Subhuti as a shravaka. Now, in particular, of course, Subhuti is an arahat. And if you remember from my pla uh, the past classes lately, arahat is this shravaka, meaning this, that's what, where that path leads, being an arahat. And that path begins with being a stream enterer, a shrotopanna. This chapter is really, really important for understanding Mahayana Buddhism. So it's taking this idea of the four fruits, the, the fruit of being a stream enterer, once returner, non returner, and arhat, but it deals with it in a very interesting way. Let me just read it to you really quickly. The Buddha asks Subhuti, Subhuti, what do you think? Is a Shrotopanna, a stream enterer, able to have this thought? I've obtained the fruit of a Shrotopanna, or not? So that's the question. Subhuti, is a stream enterer able to have this thought? I'm a stream enterer. Subhuti replies, no, World Honored One. Why is that? Shrotopannas are named for entering the stream. Yet in reality, 
there's nowhere to enter. Not entering into visible forms, not entering into sounds, scents, flavors, feelings, or even thoughts. That's called a shrotopanna. So I want to just break that down a little bit. This is the subtle thing that the Vajrapraniparamita Sutra does. It does it throughout, but this chapter is a really good representation of it. It takes what is a basic early Buddhist idea, this, this four stage structure, and it kind of turns the whole thing on its head a little bit. And it does so by this interesting question of, and by the way, I, I, I should have mentioned this earlier, in other nights when I've talked about the stream enterer, in fact, I did a whole night, a few night, a few Sundays ago on the idea of no self, anatta. And in the course of that whole Dharma talk on no self, I stressed many times that for most schools of early Buddhism, for most schools of Theravada Buddhism, to have a kind of realization or understanding of anatta, of no self, is what makes one a stream enterer. But the Buddha asks an interesting question, which is, is, does a, is a stream enterer able to think I've become a stream enterer? How does that work, Subhuti? Right? <laughs> And of course, Subhuti is not, you know, he's, he's a, smart, uh, a smart monk. And so he answers by saying, well, no, of course not. And why? Because Shrotopanas are called that because they enter the stream. But in reality, there's nowhere to enter. And then this is where the Vajra Sutra gives its teaching. It says, not entering which is to say being attached to, abiding in, relying on. But the idea is, he says, not entering into visible forms or sounds or smells or tastes or tactility or even thoughts, not entering sense media. That's being a Shrotopanna. So, I'm not going to do a whole, we would get way off track if I did a whole Vajra Sutra talk tonight, but I just want you to know that this is a really, really subtle critique of these four stages of the early path of Buddhism. It goes on to say, Subhuti, what do you think? Is a Chakra Dagaman able to have this thought? I've obtained the fruit of a chakra dagaman, or not? Subhuti replies, no way, world honored one. Why is that? Chakra dagamans are named for returning once more. Yet in reality, there is no returning once more. That's called a chakra dagaman. So this is some subtle Vajra logic here, but it's doing the same thing by saying, you know, a Chakra Dagaman is somebody who's supposedly only coming back one more time, but there's no thing. That's the whole realization of a stream enterer is that there's no thing, no Atman that's coming back. If you understand that, you're a Chakra Dagaman. The, the Vajra Sutra is subtle that way because it's not saying there's no such thing as a Chakra Dagaman. It's just sort of tweaking the definition of it to fit the logic of no self a little better. He does the same thing with the Anagaman. Subhuti, what do you think? Is an Anagaman able to have this thought? I've obtained the fruit of an Anagaman or not. No world honored one. And why? 
anagamans are named for not returning. Yet in reality, there is no not returning. That's an anagaman. So it's getting more and more subtle as the stages should. But then we get to what I really wanted to tell you about. Subuti, what do you think? Is an arhat able to have this thought? I've obtained the fruit of an arhat or not? Subuti replies, no, world honored one. Why is this? In reality, there is nothing. There is no dharma that is called an arhat. There is nothing that is an arhat. World honored one. If arhats had this thought, I've obtained the way of an arhat, then they would be attached to a self, an individuality, a sentient being, or even life. World honored one. The Buddha says, this is Subhuti talking, by the way. The Buddha says that I have obtained the indisputable samadhi, that I am first and foremost among arhats, foremost arhat freed from desire, world honored one. I don't have this thought. I am an arhat freed from desire, world honored one. If I had this thought, I've obtained the way of an arhat, then the world honored one wouldn't have said, Subhuti is the one who enjoys aranya practice. Since in reality, Subhuti has nothing to practice. He is called Subhuti, the one who enjoys aranya practice. Okay, so that's, the, that's all of chapter nine. Obviously, I wanted us to get to that end part, which is about Subhuti as this, the one who enjoys Aranya practice. So indeed, Subhuti is one of the 10 chief disciples of the Buddha, one of the early, you know, famous Arhats, and was known for being a forest dweller someone who was known to go off alone into the woods. So you might think, you might think Subhuti enjoys solitude, right? But my point is this little dialogue between Subhuti and the Buddha was very, very interesting, right? Because it's dealing with this, um, well, it's a paradox in that sense of what sense does it make, especially for an arhat to say, I'm an arhat. In particular, what sense does it make for the arhat to say, I've obtained the fruit of an arhat? right? It, it, it's a problem in that way. And what the Vajra Sutra points out, it says it, or Subhuti says it. He says, world honored one. If I did have this thought, I'm an arhat, then I'd be attached to myself. So it's a bit of a paradox. And in order to avoid this little paradox, Subhuti, who is very wise, he doesn't say he's an arhat. The Buddha says I'm an arhat in that sense. So he doesn't claim it himself. He, but it's this really subtle thing about the world honored one says that, <clears throat> that I, Subhuti in that sense, right? have obtained this very high state of a samadhi, this 
non-contesting or indisputable samadhi that I'm basically the first and foremost of arhats, arhat most freed from desire, that first of the kleshas, right? He says, we're alone in one. I don't have that thought that I'm an arhat. Then he says, if I had that thought, I've obtained, I'm an arhat. So if I thought of myself as an arhat, then the Buddha would not have said of me, Subhuti is the one who enjoys Aranya practice. But since in reality, there's nothing to practice, he's called Subhuti, the one who enjoys Aranya practice. <laughs> So I just, you know, the Vajra Sutra is notorious for language. It's very aware of language. And so it's always riding this very subtle line with lots of double negatives <laughs> to like really reinforce that point. But what I want you to notice from, and it's why I wanted to read the whole upper part of the sutra or part of the chapter there's a redefining of all these things going on. The Vajra Sutra here has redefined stream entry, redefined once returner, non-returner, and in a sense has redefined what an arhat is. And what I'm pointing at is that it has redefined it and at the same time, is kind of redefining Aranya practice. And what I mean by that is, is now Aranya practice becomes synonymous with this solitude with no self, no one being alone. No, if you see what I'm getting at, right? Like that, is Aranya practice. And there's a way then at that point, you could be doing that in a way anywhere, always, not just in the forest per se. My feeling is, is that one should probably read the Manjushri Pure Land Sutra that we're reading in light of the Vajra Sutra. I wouldn't read this as referring to the Aranya practice of old. I would read it as being the Aranya practice of the Vajra Sutra, which, again, I, in terms of my three levels of interpretation here, this doesn't deny the first one, that a bodhisattva should enjoy solitude. <laughs> it doesn't deny that, but it's just at a deeper level, the actual language the sutra is using has so much significance to it that it means a lot more than just solitude. <laughs> that was my point. That was my long, long point. Yeah, no. <laughs> I have a question about the Vajra Sutra, that chapter. Um, Great. It, it, it's not till uh, they get they get to the arhat that he actually says, you know, if an arhat says I'm an arhat, then he's re referencing himself. So he's not an arhat. The previous ones, they're kind of more indirect. Like the first one, said, it doesn't say there's no way to enter a stream. There says there's no stream to enter. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious. And then it kind of, then the next one, I think that uses, there's no entering or something. It The language kind of, evolves that way. I'm just curious about that and what that means. It almost, you know what I mean? I do know what you mean. And it is about what that's about, Noam, is it, it, it has to do with the, the way the Vajra Sutra is in general. But this chapter in particular, there's so much wordplay going on. There's so much in the language that 
they're really focusing on the language of stream entry not like yeah it's just about that they, they they're focusing on this idea of entering the stream and what i'm what i would get at what i would want to say is in the in the hinayana in the early version of this the stream enterer has entered the stream as have other stream enterers all the rest of us suckers are on the shore of samsara not in the stream so what the what they're interested in is this idea and this language of having moved somewhere having entered this stream and again this idea that some of these people haven't entered the stream yet and that's what makes one a stream enterer and then those people not stream enterers this chapter has tweaked that a little bit and says you know what <laughs> there's no stream there's nowhere to enter if you get that you're a stream enterer and that doesn't create any division between us stream enterers and the non-stream enterers if that makes sense <laughs> so, so it's is it then is it, it's not directly getting at the idea of no self or is it and i'm just not or is it doing it, it in a roundabout way it is it is and if you of course read the entire vajra sutra it's entirely focused on this idea of no, of no self in that sense again i would just return to the chapter wants to have a little fun with these words the words that mean stream enterer the words that literally mean once returning and non-returning and then they're having fun with that those ideas and it's only at the arhat which of course does mean worthy one that you get more of a, an explicit reference to the self but they are all interested in that idea known yeah tanya yeah it was striking me that it was like it was sort of talking about emptiness of other stuff first and then working its way up to like and by the way oh yeah and like you're the, you're empty again reminder absolutely like you're empty there's you know no you to be empty anyway absolutely and for both Noam and tanya for both your comments let's remember that this teaching of emptiness is applicable to all phenomena and so it was only in the first example that they wanted to focus on the emptiness of this stream that everybody thinks they're entering in that way and then the other two by the way known too they are explicitly referencing the self but they're referencing it in terms of the idea of a reincarnated self and saying but in reality there is no one more returning self i could i could insert the yeah yeah Okay, so those are some levels of interpretation to the first quality here of enjoying solitude. It goes deep in that way. A lot of different ways you could interpret that. Number two, also some interpretive issues. So the second quality that we learned about was about giving the gift of Dharma without expectation of material reward. So if I jump back over to the Chinese, oh, actually, let's just approach that at the surface level. Giving the gift of Dharma without expectation of material reward, uh, that would be, I don't know, I guess that could be like me in that regard. 
I get up every Sunday night, talk about the Dharma, and I try and in that sense, I'm not doing it for the riches, the wealth, the views. I really kind of doing it to do it in that sense. So there you go. There's one surface level practical interpretation of what the first one means to give the gift of the Dharma without expecting material reward. Now, if I read that literally, I would think that I could potentially expect some immaterial reward, right? I don't actually think that that is suggested, but the language here, if you only were reading this in English, you might be left to wonder. So let's dig a little deeper. Let's go to that second level here. So our Chinese one here is without expectation of receiving anything. It's not really specific about what that would be in that way. Um, I guess grammatically, I flip all that around and it's about practicing Dharma dana, practicing Dharma dana without expecting anything in return. That's <laughs> what it says. And the tricky part about that is then this idea of the practice of Dharma dana. Now, the Chinese is. Yeah, I mean, the Chinese is grammatically lining up with the Tibetan, where it's about giving the gift of the Dharma. Chinese is a little looser, though, as far as subject verb object structure goes. And it could be it's about practicing the Dharma of Dana, practicing the dana generosity without expectation of anything in, it, in return it, this is one of those ones where i actually definitely don't think it really matters if this is just giving the dharma or practicing the dharma of giving i do feel like only giving the dharma is a little narrow whereas the sentiment of practicing giving without expecting anything in return is definitely the heart of this quality of the bodhisattva. It's, I think, very clear in both the Chinese and this Tibetan translation that what we're really interested in here as bodhisattvas is giving without expecting anything in return. All right. That you know, lines up pretty well with the Bodhisattva vow in that sense. I would, though, want to, let's see, do we have time? I don't really have time for this too much, but I would refer you then just to, in terms of a line of thinking, there's a very, very famous anthropology book called The Gift by Marcel Mauss, M-A-U-S-S. -S. Very famous anthropology book about, well, he uses a particular case study of a Native American potlatch where gifts are exchanged by different uh, Native American tribes and a kind of about the ritual of that. But what his book is interested in, if you've ever read it or heard about it, it's interested in the, the, the social performance of gift giving and a very subtle thing that goes on with gift giving, which is that if I give you something, there's a way in which you, now you're indebted to me. It's the sneaky side of gifts. <laughs> and the thing about it is, is that that book, The Gift and Marcel Mauss, he builds a whole anthropological theory out of this 
mm, uh, exchange, this way of exchange. It's very, you know, capitalist in that sense of everything being very calculated and in that way. But the reason why I referenced that book and that way of thinking is that it's actually kind of deeply, I think, ingrained into us in some way to either to either give a gift and then sort of expect something in return, even if that's a thank you. So I'm not even talking about an equal exchange in that way. Like I gave you a car, where's my car? But it's just this sense that if I gave you something, <laughs> right? There's something maybe do this way. Again, even if it's a thank you. The other way that this can work is you give me a gift and now I feel like I owe you something. Right? So that way of thinking regarding gifts, giving and exchange, again, seems to be pretty deeply ingrained. And so a quality of a bodhisattva is that they are generous, they are givers, whether it be of the Dharma or otherwise, but it's done in this way where there's no expectation of a return in that sense. It is truly kind of, I think, a practice to, to do that. And I think the practice, like all Buddhist practice, is about stopping and noticing, which is to say, if you get a gift and you feel indebted, notice that. And if you give a gift and notice that you're feeling like, wait, where's mine? Notice that in that way. That's all. Very simple practice of just noticing those reactions and those behaviors in that way. And then, of course, the idea here is at a deeper level, at a deeper level, of course, the bodhisattva is sort of always with and aware of that which constructs notions of self. It's a very, it's a place where the bodhisattva practices a lot, noticing those things which construct that notion of self. And so that idea of giving without expecting anything in return is very coupled with that notion of self. What I'm getting at is, is that notice how if you are really, really deep into a practice of no self and somebody were to come along and say like, hey, can I have the shirt off your back? You notice how you, that could be done and the person wouldn't expect anything in return because they're not operating from that place of self. So I want you to just notice how there kind of has to be that notion of self in order to expect something in return. They, they go really hand in hand in that way. So everybody feeling okay about the second quality? Again, whether it's giving Dharma or giving anything in that sense. And now the third one. So the third quality, if I, again, if I were to read it face value from the English translation, the bodhisattvas abide by their vows of discipline. So, our vows of discipline, in this case, are the, the basic shila, morality of Buddhism, right? Avoiding killing, taking what's not given, false speech, right? The basics, that's our vow of morality. And to abide by our vows in discipline. Makes sense, I think, <laughs> in terms of going for not backsliding, not regressing. That makes sense. Because, again, the way that I set this up, the way that I defined regressing 
or degenerating was this idea of, you know what? I'm, I wanna be a truth speaker. I, I, I wanna not be deceptive. Even those stupid little exaggerations and white, white lies. Yeah, I don't wanna, I wanna be truthful and honest. So that's my vow, but I might slip. <laughs> In fact, I do often with those little white lies and exaggerations where I don't even quite know why I distorted that, but I just did. So that's me backsliding or regressing to falseness, but I notice it. I go, oh, I did that thing again where I exaggerated for no reason. Oh, and then the idea is eventually you reach a state of, not regressing, where you, it wouldn't even dawn on you anymore to distort or exaggerate in that way. You just would no longer see it advantageous and it wouldn't occur to you to do it, right? If that's where you're going, if that's what you're going for, then not abiding in your vow to do that is the number one way to not achieve that, right? Very, very simple at face value. So again, at face value, this says, abide by, the bodhisattvas abide by their vows of discipline. If we go over to our Chinese version, first of all, it has a much stronger sense of not just abiding. It does have abide, even the very, um, word that would be translated actually as peacefully abide, actually says peacefully abide, but the Chinese has a slightly stronger idea of, of being grounded or stable. So it's, it's a nice addition that they maybe isn't in the Tibetan, but it's about the bodhisattvas being stable or firmly in a peacefully abiding state in terms of, and well, the thing that I want you to, the thing that I want you to know that the Chinese has, that's really important that I think they left out of the Tibetan version. It's about the, the kind of the meaning of the vows that we've taken. Firmly standing by the meaning of the vows of discipline we've taken. That would be the way I would read the Chinese in a kind of really rough way. My point is though, is that this really, it kind of speaks about the, what we would say is the spirit of the law rather than the letter of the law. That's a very, very important aspect of the bodhisattva path versus the arhat, shravaka, kind of that path. The, the monastic, hardcore, ascetic, shravaka style path is very much the letter of the law. If the Buddha said this, this, and that, we do that, that, and that we abide by the letter. In the Bodhisattva Mahayana tradition, founded on a lot of different ideas, Upaya probably being chief among them, there's much more attention paid to what is called Artha, the meaning of the law, the meaning of the Vinaya, the meaning of the discipline. And what, I, what this kind of allows for is, well, what eventually becomes called in, I, I, mean, I don't even know when this started, probably in the 20th century. I don't think it has a history before that. But Buddhism becomes kind of labeled as kind of having a, what is called a relative ethic, that the ethics are kind of relative to the situation, that's very much this idea of the spirit or the meaning of the discipline rather than the strict letter of it. 
And I want to remind you too, if you don't know this, shortly after the Buddha passed away, like within not too long amount of time, there was the first major split or division in the Sangha. And it happened at what is called the first or the second council. And there was a major dispute that separated these two Buddhist monastic groups forever. And what they argued over and fought over was one of the groups of monastics, they were carrying salt in a rhinoceros horn. And one group said, you're breaking the Vinaya, you're breaking the law. Because the Buddha said, the, the Vinaya says that you have to eat whatever you're given. And if you can't finish it, you have to dispose of it. And there are proper ways of disposing of leftover food in, in, in the Vinaya. But the whole point was, is that you couldn't keep leftovers. You had to go out the next day and beg again. You couldn't keep every anything. So then in the morning you have like a little snack or you have a like a late night snack that was prohibited. So one group found out about another group that was carrying salt. And they said, you guys are breaking the Vinaya because the Buddha said you can't preserve or keep food. And they were like, it's not food though. And they were like, no, it is, you eat it, right? It's food. And of course, the, the group that was carrying the salt, they were using it at, for a number of reasons, of course, because salt can be used for all kinds of things medicinally and of course, culinarily. But they didn't think of it as what the Buddha meant. They, they were like, no, we're not break. We, un we understand what the Buddha was talking about, <laughs> which is that he didn't want us keeping leftovers and doing all that. And we're not doing that, but we got this salt thing that we're doing. <laughs> and that was a split over strict adherence to the letter of the law versus a group that was more about the spirit of the law. That sort of divide continues, wherein the Theravada tradition, that more Southeast Asian tradition sticks a little bit more to the letter, which is why they're a little bit more hardcore, a little like, or not a little, they're very conservative. They really preserve the old school Vinaya because they're more about the letter of the law Whereas the whole Mahayana tradition is about this idea of the spirit of the Dharma in that sense. And that the Bodhisattva, in particular, because the Bodhisattva is practicing in the world, they're not at the Vihara, they're not a, a renunciant in that strict sense. So the idea is, is that they're going to already be interpreting the spirit of the Dharma for their situation and applying it appropriately. And that, in a sense, or in that case, would be upaya. So I just want you to know that my interpretation, the way that I read this, I would definitely want you to know that this says, at least in the Chinese, it has a little bit more to do with this distinction between sticking to the spirit of one's vows in that way so okay any questions comments answers ideas about all of that about the three qualities non-regression all right then i think that's it um that's all i got that's it for tonight. Those are the three qualities of a bodhisattva that if you got those three, enjoying solitude, giving without expecting anything in return, 
and stick into your guns, right? Stick into your vows. Those are the three. So hope that all makes sense. And I hope it's applicable to life beyond just this sutra. So. All right, I'll pass it over to Tanya or Noam or whoever. Yeah. Thanks so much. Um, do you have any announcements, um, Michael, that you want to make? No, just I'll be here next Sunday.